Uh, you've been a urologist for many years and recently for all of Europe through the European Commission, uh, European Union, a patient advocate as well as a policy, health policy advocate. Well, I have, I, it's a real pleasure for me that uh, I'm allowed or invited to uh, speak and to just ventilate what we are trying to do we here in Europe uh, at the level of the Commission. Uh, you know, there's screening programs for three types of tumors in Europe now that are recommended is for breast, for cervical, and for colorectal cancer. And prostate was not in, and this was made, these recommendations in 2003. Now we want to change that and have prostate cancer on the agenda and include it, and this will be clear during my presentation, not for a mass screening as we have done before, but really an early detection risk stratification. So I'm happy that I can share the views that we have developed uh, with the EAU and that we are bringing to the policymakers today. This, isn't there an urgent need to start, start early detection of prostate cancer? And I'm representing the EAU as Adjunct Secretary General for eight years and before I directed the European School of uh, Urology. Uh, we have 18,000 members worldwide and lots of them are uh, from uh, North America, from Canada and the United States. We have our evidence-based practice guidelines. We have our patient information initiative. I will communicate the WWW address for that. And we have the highest impact journal in urology and nephrology worldwide. Uh, our European urology has now an impact factor of 17, which is higher than the JUro and urology, the, the, the most ranked uh, journals in the United States. I'm happy for this third annual prostate cancer patient conference that I can tell something about prostate cancer and its early detection. And I think when you look at Western Europe and Northern America, the incidence is very much the same. Uh, we have a higher uh, mortality rate than you have, but we know that uh, certainly for the African-American origin man, there is a higher likelihood to die, for, to get prostate cancer and to die from it. And one, one very important thing to know if we talk prostate cancer, and you see this is a publication from 1996, where they did autopsies on people that had uh, an accident and died. And they took the prostate out and they were looking on which, pay, which uh, sufferers or which victims actually had prostate cancer under the microscope. And you see that even at young ages, there is a certain percentage that already have microscopically prostate cancer. And if you go to uh, people that are 80 years of age, nearly about everybody will have prostate cancer microscopically. And this is obviously what makes the problem that so many people have prostate cancer, but the chance of dying from it is much, much lower. Uh, I need to reflect on the situation in Europe this is the figures of 2010, and it doesn't matter how many there are, but it's the most prevalent male cancer. And the, the number that died in 2010 was 92,000. And in 2018, while we are wiser, while our treatments are better, the mortality has risen. So there's something wrong with prostate cancer, and we spend a lot of money in treating it. So it's the most common, and in Europe, it's one out of seven will develop prostate cancer. And I know that in certain ethnic groups in, in your country, that's even higher. Now, if we look before we had prostate-specific antigen, nearly one out of two, or up to one out of three prostate cancer patients died of their disease. But then we had PSA, and PSA came around uh, here, 1985. And you see, if this is the incidence of prostate cancer, once PSA was used, we detected many more cancers. And if you think at the number of people that had prostate cancer on autopsy, you understand. If you stick needles in a prostate and you take biopsies, you will find many, many tumors. But after a couple of years, this came down at the normal rise. There is a rising incidence on prostate cancer over the years. And this has now, this overdiagnosis has mostly been uh, recovered. And at the same time, a couple of years after diagnosing more, you see that the mortality has come down. So that's a major achievement. And if we look and compare 
prostate cancer to all the other cancers listed here. Look here, bladder. The improvement that we have made to change the mortality from bladder cancer in these years is about nothing. The most impressive progress has been made for prostate cancer. So no other uh, tumor type did actually better. But the problem was that we had overdiagnosis and overtreatment. I do not go into the randomized clinical screening trials that we have done. Uh, there has been a lot of criticism on the American trial because there was much contamination. So people in the non-screened arm had PSA samplings. This is the European randomized study. This is the Swedish study. And just to explain, if you look, the longer follow-up you have, you will see that the curves continue to separate. So the longer follow-up, the more advantage there is of prostate cancer screening. And we have now data from the European study that at 20 years of follow-up, the decrease in prostate cancer mortality is 54%. So this is huge difference in screening and non-screening men. This is the 52 and 54% decreases, as you can see in the Rotterdam cohort, the very pure cohort without contamination, actually. No. So we know that we can use it for early detection. We know that we detect the disease earlier. That's what we call stage migration, prostate cancer uh, uh, that comes down, but it exposes to overdiagnosis and overtreatment. And therefore, PSA testing has been discouraged. And the lead has been taken actually by the United States Preventive Services Task Force, who have recommended against it, saying you will not die with prostate, you will not die from prostate cancer, but you will die with prostate cancer like so many. And the treatment can have unpleasant side effects. And the problem was the prostate cancer diagnosis that we had so many years ago, we were unable to discriminate between significant and insignificant cancers. So about all of them got active treatment. And this is not what we do today any longer. But this has resulted in an anti-PSA propaganda. I myself, having done more than 3,000 radical prostatectomies, I am sure that in the beginning of my experience in the early 90s, I have certainly done surgery on 15% of males that did not deserve to have treatment at that moment. Maybe later we needed to change, but today this would be uh, followed with active surveillance and eventually in a second time active treatment. But what happened since? I do not have to show you these figures. Since prostate has become the number two male killing cancer in the United States. And if you see primary diagnosis after the recommendation against PSA testing, in a metastatic stage, this is people that get the diagnosis of prostate cancer and they are already metastatic, is steadily increasing. So more and more cancers are detected too late. This is very recent data from the Journal of the National Cancer Institute in your country. And you see that patients with nodal disease increase, patients with distant bone metastasis increase, because of the recommendations against screening five years after these recommendations were made. And this is maybe a difficult graph, but here in brown is what happened with prostate cancer mortality. There was an increase and PSA came around, the mortality went down and down and down. And then after the recommendations against testing, it, the going down stopped. And there is a slight increase, 5% in one year, increasing mortality. And we just let this go on without undertaking anything. In Germany, prostate kills more men than colorectal. It's number two. And the diagnosis in a locally advanced stage, this means when the patient gets the diagnosis, when it was only 29% in 2008, it's now around 50%. And this is the patients that are at risk to die from it because we cannot cure all locally advanced and regionally advanced prostate cancer patients. Other data from the United Kingdom, prostate cancer death increased by 17% in the last 10 years. And if this is breast cancer, you see now there is more men dying from prostate than women from breast cancer. And this is an imp impressive evolution and we cannot uh, let this help.
Now, another consideration is what is the cost of these too late diagnosed prostate cancers? Well, look at this man. He was diagnosed here with prostate cancer and he had surgery. That's about what the cost is in Europe. I know that it might be more expensive in the United States. He relapsed, he had radio, salvage radiotherapy for this price, and then in the end, he became metastatic since he was detected too late, probably a T3, T3B, at least 8, 9, or 10. So he got medical castration, which is 11,000. But then in the end, we know if he survives, if he does not die from other diseases, he will become castrate refractory prostate cancer. And he will get all these more or less expensive drugs that for a miserable last two to four years with a poor quality of life of castrated man suffering the complications of all these treatments will cost the society 240,000 euros, which is tenfold more than the treatment of localized disease. Now, there is another thing. People become aware, men become aware of prostate cancer because they hear that friends die, that young people can get it, and they go for opportunistic screening. We do not have organized screening today. And if you do opportunistic screening, there is no improvement in prostate cancer mortality. And opportunistic screening does not avoid overdiagnosis and overtreatment. So we cannot let this continue the way it is now. And I just look at COVID. COVID-19, new cancer diagnosis, this is the figure for Belgium, minus 15% new cancers have been detected, uh, prostate cancers. These are all at risk of, again, being detected too late. But the times have changed. Luckily, everybody who would plea against prostate cancer screening and early detection has forgotten that we have made an enormous progress because we can now better use PSA, age-related, PSA density, this means a larger prostate will have more PSA shot in the blood, PSA velocity, and then there is the risk calculators. And there is the American one, there is the Canadian one, the PCPT, there is the uh, European randomized screening for prostate cancer uh, risk calculators, and there is upcoming molecular biomarkers like the Stockholm, like PHI, like uh, 4KY, and so on. So we can now much better know which patient is at risk to have a significant cancer. And if they are low risk, we do not do anything about them but clinical follow-up. If they are high or intermediate risk, they first get a multi-parametric and maybe even a much cheaper and faster biparametric MRI before they get a biopsy. And I will show what the implication is, but we will do much less biopsies, have much less overdiagnosis. We will detect more significant and less insignificant cancers. And then in the end, when they have cancer, some of them will not need to be treated, which I didn't know 20 years ago. But what we know today is that uh, uh, low risk and a certain category of intermediate risk patients can just go on active surveillance. And we have now nomograms to predict disease progression in man so that they can safely adhere to it. And as I said, we have been lobbying with the EAU in the European Parliament. We had white papers. We have involved Europa, Womo, the patient organizations, ECPC. Movember has supported us. And we went three times to the Parliament to tell them what? Recommendations for the European Union and the European Commission on early detection. And this is what we propose. First of all, we do not do blunt PSA testing in every man of a certain age without information. The EAU, and here is the website where you can find our activities and that we have an extensive patient information activity. So in well-informed man, this is the patient information leaflet, we recommend to do risk stratification. This means, I'm not going to go into detail, but let's say someone is 55, he has a PSA, uh, which is lower than one nanogram per ml. Well, he should have a repeat uh, PSA after a couple of years. If he is 70, one to three nanogram per ml, he will have a repeat PSA at two to four years. So no immediate biopsy like we did before, but once they are above three, and this figure comes from the ERSPC data, then they need to have a further risk stratification. And this is still underused because this is important to know which patients then finally will need an MRI. And you see the risk stratification will make that some of them will be low risk, 
and will go for clinical follow-up. Some will be high risk and they first get an MRI. And with the MRI you do, again, you will have three categories. The ones who are high risk, pirates four and five. One and two is low risk, pirates three gets a new risk certification related to the PSA density, to the, PSA, the prostate volume. And again, there is a number of people that just go for active surveillance, but in the end, these ones with high risk will have systematic and targeted biopsies. This is what we advocate today. A number of them have no cancer, clinical follow-up. A number of them have grade one or early grade two. They go for active surveillance. And when it's grade uh, group three, they go for active treatment. And this is the risk calculators. They're freely available. Even patients can look at it and say, I'm that age, I have this PSA, am I at risk of having significant prostate cancer or not? But the main change has been that an abnormal PSA does not mean a biopsy any longer. And we have tried to calculate what this means when you do this population based. And you see the figures are there, but I, I do not want to go into detail. But this elevated PSA needs reflex testing. And you will distill 35% of MRIs will be avoided. So you spare money here. Those with an MRI risk stratification, Pirates 1 and 2, and some Pirates 3, again, go for clinical follow-up and you avoid to do biopsies in a number of them. And so finally, from the multi-parametric MRI, that all people that undergo a biopsy uh, will have, 35% will have prostate cancer in the end, and one-fourth of them will benefit from active surveillance without active treatment. So what is the cost of this? A PSA in Belgium costs 10 euro. A multi-parametric MRI, 136. A biparametric will not be more than 85 to 90 euros. An early detected significant prostate cancer treatment is 10 to 15. And what we do now, we do less biopsies. We have less complication of the biopsies. We do less overdiagnosis. We avoid overtreatment. We do not need to pay 240,000 euros for too late detected prostate cancer. We will have less prostate cancer deaths, more income from an increased professional lifespan. And finally, prostate cancer patients have the best quality of life if either they have active surveillance or an active treatment uh, at an early stage because the prostatectomy or radiotherapy is not uh, without uh, side effects, but not severe side effects if you can tackle this early. So what have we proposed to the EU beat cancer plan where the European Union is putting a lot of money? How do we tell them to tackle prostate cancer? We must use PSA properly. Well-informed man, 45 to 50, until a life expectancy of 70. I know that in the United States, you, you work with 70 years of age. If we see the number of people that today become 85 and 90, I think life expectancy is a better parameter to handle. Then use the risk calculators, age-related PSA, PSA density. Biomarkers are coming, but we do not need to wait for them because MRI already gives us the possibility to cut down on this overdiagnosis. We only biopsy those at risk for significant cancer. We treat actively only those at risk to die from the disease, and we give active surveillance to those with low and intermediate risk. So we will decrease the prostate cancer cost, decrease the mortality, and improve quality of life. So the take-home messages is that I want that Stella Kiriakides and Ursula von der Leyen, we are in Europe governed by women now, and I hope they will do something for men because men have not been taking care of themselves in a sufficient way. But in the Europe's Beat Cancer Plan, we want that is included that a well-informed, healthy man should be offered early detection, starting with PSA, applying the algorithm that we have proposed. And we will need to give a lot of information to the healthy population and to the GPs that are very much opposed in Europe against the PSA testing. So no uninformed mass screening, but a man today should know when he's 40, 45, if you do not want to die from prostate cancer. You cannot avoid to get it, but you can avoid to die from it. And that's the most important message that we want to bring to the politicians. Thank you. Thank you. It does raise a ton of questions. There's a presumption that early treatment actually saves lives. Well, it's, it's obviously, there's a big dilemma there. 
there is the fear for the, the toxicity and the side effects of the treatment. If you can treat prostate cancer at an early stage, because you have early detected it, you have this stage migration, you see them early. You can do a radical prostatectomy on a T2 tumor, release an eight that has been detected with a good nerve sparing bilaterally with preserving potency and continence. If you do not have to treat a locally advanced tumor uh, with radiotherapy, if you have a locally advanced, you will have to give hormones on top of that with all the negative consequences. So your quality of life after an active treatment will always be better than the quality of life that patients have once they become metastatic. Now, metastatic disease cannot be cured. And lucky are those, lucky are those that have the opportunity to die from something else while they are on medical treatment. But do not forget that also androgen deprivation is partly responsible for people dying for cardiovascular morbidity and cardiovascular mortality. So saying I do want to postpone until I get metastatic and then I got treat treated, no, the treatment that you get at that moment is a palliative treatment that doesn't cure you and that gives you, in my opinion, at least this is what I see in European men, a terrible quality of life. Castrated men that lose their libido, they lose their drive, they uh, get overweight, they, got, uh, they are not interested in anything. I, I believe that the quality of life, once you become metastatic, is so poor that we should, at all price, try to avoid it. We have certainly made progress. When, when I saw my first metastatic patients, they were treated with uh, surgical castration at that time. They responded mostly for 16 to 18 months. Then they became progressive. And this meant that within half a year to one year, they died. Because we had, we gave uh, mitomycin C was the best we had. So we have had much better chemotherapy. We have had all the second line hormonal treatments today. Uh, we have the bone treatment uh, facilities that are readily available and given. So we have done much better. And today when someone becomes castrated and castrate refractory, instead of surviving half a year to a year, they survive today for three up to three years. So there is a life extension, but again, the quality of life is not good. These patients complain, and we have a very nice study from Europa Womo that you might have seen in the literature uh, uh, published by, by their group with uh, also Monique Grobel and, and others, where you see that the quality of life, once you get castrated, is so poor. And this is not only, this is also anxiety, stress, sleeping disorders, fatigue, and all these things, which are terrible. These are no man any longer. So I do... I see that we have an extension of the life expectancy. We do much better than 20 years ago, lucky. But we do not make them survive in a better condition. Yeah. The quality of life remains poor. Yeah, I imagine. Well, how has COVID confounded all the risk calculators, the nanograms, perhaps some of the uh, advanced stage therapies and overall our understanding of what health screening is about. I, I'm not sure that the impact of COVID uh, will remain and will have a definitive impact on our population survival. Obviously, there is a lot of elder people that have died from COVID that otherwise might have suffered prostate cancer and died from prostate cancer. Uh, the too late diagnosis is something that uh, we're going to pay. We will have to pay for those that come too late because of COVID. But this goes by. We've already seen in the Netherlands and in Belgium, for instance, that the dip in diagnosis that we have had during the first wave of uh, COVID, when people did not dare to go to the hospital, simply they didn't see their doctor, they didn't have PSH sex. This has already recovered. This is coming, this is coming back. So those that we will probably compensate for that in the years to come. So at the long run, I do not believe that it will have a severe impact, but we will indeed have more too late diagnosis for two reasons. The first is COVID is one of them. And the second is because of the anti-PSA anti lobbying that has been very, very strong in, with, uh, with GPs here, for instance, in Belgium. 
You know, do you think the anti-PSA uh, lobbying is parallel and in tandem or linked with uh, anti-COVID uh, vaccination people and that kind of thinking? No, no, I don't think so. Okay. No, it's, it's the, the old concept that we are not able to uh, avoid overdiagnosis and overtreatment. And still, if you discuss with people that are really uh, against uh, uh, early detection strategies, it's each time come back, uh, the harm-benefit ratio is not okay because you overdiagnose, you overtreat patients that do not need it. And I think we can, uh, at a very large extent, avoid this to happen. Uh, our, our feeling is we just encourage people age 40 and over to talk to their doctors about prostate cancer. We want the conversation started. We want other disease states addressed as well, diabetes, hypertension, particularly for underserved people. How, the question really is, 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 our, is our focus and attention drawn so much to PSA and a blood draw that we're missing the boat on developing better diagnostic opportunities? Where's the better blood test? I think I can, I can quote uh, Bill Catalona here. When so many years ago he said, PSA is actually the best, the best we have. It's, it's not optimal. It's not uh, super, but it's, it's the best we have. And it's very cheap at the same time. Uh, are there better tests today? There aren't. The only thing we can improve with all the tests that are upcoming and I mentioned the Stockholm, this is now in the clinical trial in uh, Scandinavia. Uh, there is uh, the prostate health index. There is uh, all, all the other biomarkers, MDX, et cetera. They will all help to better risk stratify. But that's the only thing they can do. It's, it's a likelihood uh, calculation. But there is no tumor marker better than PSA because it's not expensive, but you need not to... Uh, link uh, investigations to a certain PSA value. You need to risk stratify and look in every single patient. And that will be improved. I'm pretty sure that the algorithm that I have shown will further be improved. And we will have even less overdiagnosis in the years to come by adding these new biomarkers, as long as they will be available and affordable for the health insurance. Let's talk about underserved communities. Do you think it's appropriate for countries that don't have facilities uh, beyond a surgical suite to be offering PSAs? I mean, should we do PSA tests in Mauritania or, or Burkini Faso? Yeah, that, that, that's a question that we really in Europe have not investigated since working with the EU and outside the EAU, there's many European countries where even the global life expectancy for man today is below 70. So it's probably not useful to do, to propose what we propose now uh, for Western European countries and part of uh, the Eastern European countries. Uh, do we need to do it in Mauritania? Do we, look, th there is ethnic uh, problems, there is people from whom we know that they've developed more aggressive cancers, that the mortality is higher. And I think there again, it needs to be done as recommended in, in your country as well on a shared decision-making where you look in an individual who is uh, healthy otherwise. Uh, uh, but what, what, I, what I want primary care to do is not take a cholesterol in a man and prescribe him uh, pills for the rest of his life and check his glycemia and his uric acid, but talk to these patients about the, the possibility of getting prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is a very bad tumor. It's, it's unlikely like many others, the, the, the bone metastatic stages of prostate cancer at the end of life, they are terrible because of the nature of the metastases that are osteoblastic, this means you get bone that is growing in the bone and it's so terribly painful. It's, it's more terrible than any other disease where you, you fracture because of osteolysis, it's osteolytic metastasis. So we cost what cost we need to avoid to get people to that terrible stage. So what needs to be to get finance is information first, information campaign and informed man is an important issue, inform the GPs will cost money as well. But then there is the availability of the, the, the different steps that you have seen in the algorithm. 
for instance, I know that uh, in Europe, Romania has the lowest number of MRI machines uh, per uh, number of uh, inhabitants uh, in the entire Europe. In Scandinavia, they have the most. Now, th the concept is that a PSA that is abnormal should not lead to a biopsy. This needs to stop. If already you use the PSA density, this is PSA related to the prostate volume, and you just look at ethnic factors, familial uh, history, eventually BRCA2 uh, gene mutations, uh, those risk factors, you do then not need MRI to already half the number of people that you subject to further investigations, maybe to biopsy, with the risk of overdiagnosis and overtreatment again, just without an MRI. So if MRI is available, it's ideal to use it, obviously, because the risk stratification is uh, further down. And if after the MRI you have Stockholm and you have the other biomarkers that I mentioned before, it's going to be, it's going to be better and better every year because there's always newcomers. What politicians say you need to prove with a clinical trial that, for instance, Stockholm or PHI, uh, adding to MRI, will, will indeed be beneficial. It will be beneficial, and we will show it over the years. But I do not need to do a clinical trial, of which I have to attend, wait for 20 years to have mm -hmm. the result to change something about what we now let happen. It's an increasing mortality of prostate cancer. It's a continued wild opportunistic screening that needs to be stopped. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's important for us as prostate cancer people to be advocates for improvements in prostate cancer health policy throughout the world. And I hope this uh, discussion has helped uh, build some, uh, given you some uh, some tools to uh, help you uh, focus your activities around that. In any case, uh, thank you, Dr. Van Poppel. Uh, really a pleasure to talk with you today. Okay, thank you.